All right, good afternoon. Good morning, whatever it is. All right, how's everybody doing today? Doing well, Nick, how are you doing? Doing well, too, thank you. It's Friday, it's always a good thing. All right, uh, let's start with homework questions. Any questions on uh, the current homework for? So we're doing proofs with uh, mostly even and odd numbers and one proof on divisibility. Sure. Um, let's uh, let's do a divisibility proof. All right. So let's um, let's prove. that if, um, if some factor f divides n, then f divides um, 3n squared. <coughs> so for example, n equals uh, h, um, and f equals 4. Okay, so 4 divides 8, we know that. Um, 3n squared is 3 times 64, which is 192, and that turns out to also be divisible by 4. Alright, so we have at least one case where we have reason to believe this is, this is going to be true. Um, so let's, um, let's, let's try to do a proof. So, um, if f divides n, then f divides 3n squared. So let's start with the hypothesis, f divides n. Okay, that's generally safe to start with. Um, and then let's, let's change this into something that uses the definition of divisibility. So um, there exists some integer k such that n equals f times k. Okay, that's the definition of that vertical pipe divisibility. And over here, I'm going to make my little section for ignore. And what I want to show is that 3n squared equals 2 times some integer. Right? Well, the 3 and the 2 aren't going to work together very nicely. Right, if I try to divide by 2, I have to show that 1 and a half n squared is an integer, and that's kind of weird, right? Um, so, so I may not see immediately how to show that this can be put in that form, um, but over here I've shown that, um, sorry, I'm trying to show this is f times something. Um, over here, I've, I've shown that n can be written as f times something. Let's just take this and plug it in here. So I'm just going to sort of doodle. I'm going to do 3n squared, and I'm going to do 3 times fk squared, 3f squared, k squared. And I've got my eye on the prize. I'm trying to show that this is f times something. Well, here's an f. So if I pull out that f, 3f times k squared, and that's an integer. All right. Now, if any of this appeared over here, I lose points, right? Because I'm not doing a proof over here. This is not a proposition. This is not a proposition. This is not something that we've shown yet. This is just thinking out loud, okay? If you prefer to do it on a different page, that's fine. But sometimes it's useful to have it right here so I can see where you're going. But now I know what I'm trying to do. I'm going to substitute f times k for n. And I'm going to rewrite 3n squared like this, okay? But I have to do it in the language of propositions. So writing down 3n squared, not a proposition, lose points, okay? Here is a proposition that I can write. 
3n squared equals 3 times fk squared. That's a declarative statement. I'm claiming this is equal to that. And I'm claiming it's true. And why is it true? I'm substituting 2. Right? I'm using this in place of n. And I'm just writing 3n squared. I can write anything I want. I can write 5 equals 2 plus 3. And that's valid. I'm writing 3n squared equals something that's equal to 3n squared. Okay. Um, now I'm going to do some algebra. 3n squared equals 3f squared k squared equals f times 3f k squared. That's just algebra. But that's also the definition of divisibility. The fact that I've written 3n squared as f times something now lets me state that f divides 3n squared. And this comes directly from statement 4 and the definition of divisibility. And that's what I was trying to show. And most of the divisibility proofs will, will look and feel pretty much like this. You'll, you'll be told something divides something else, and you'll use the definition of divisibility to say, okay, that something else is a multiple of that something, an integer multiple. If you have more than one of these, don't use the same k. Call it k1, k2, or k and j, or something like that. Um, but then you basically substitute and you try to get to your conclusion, which is usually a statement about divisibility, which is again showing that something can be written as a multiple of something else. All right. Um, so somebody said a little lost with even proofs. So let's let's do a proof with even numbers. So let's see. Um, So let's prove that if n squared minus 4 is even, then n is even. All right, and the example I might try in my head, right, if n is 10, um, 10 squared is 100 minus 4 is 96. 96 is even. So if n is 10, the hypothesis is satisfied. The conclusion says 10 should be even, which it is. And just for fun, I could try an odd n, if n is 3, n squared is 9, minus 4 is 5, that's not even, and n is not even. Now that doesn't have anything to do with anything, right? But I'm just kind of seeing that this is not always the case, right? Not every number is even. And it does seem to have something to do with whether n squared minus 4 is even, okay? But you got to be really clear what direction we're trying to go in. Um, I'm, this is my hypothesis. And this is the conclusion. And we're trying to show the hypothesis implies the conclusion. So we're going to start by assuming the hypothesis and then trying to show that the conclusion follows. So step one, n squared minus four is even. That's a hypothesis. Step two, let's use the definition. n squared minus 4 equals 2 times k, where k is an integer. That's the definition of being even. And over here, in my ignore section, right, what I'm trying to do is show n is equal to 2 times some integer j. j. 
and I don't really see a way to do that. I mean, I could write this, and this, this would feel pretty tempting. That's just algebra, showing that n plus 2 times n minus 2 is equal to 2k. Well, that still doesn't feel like it's going to help me. Right? I don't know how to go from here into 2 times an integer. So this is where you start to think, yeah, let's try an indirect proof. All right. So I'm going to put this part of my work aside for a moment. And I'm going to say, what would an indirect proof be? Well, I would start off by negating the conclusion. Okay, the conclusion is n is even. So let me start off with n is odd. Technically, not n is even. Okay, but we know if it's not even, it's odd. So I'm going to just do n is odd, and that's the negation of the conclusion. And now I want to find a contradiction. Okay, well, I know that n squared minus 4 is even. That's our hypothesis. And if we don't use the hypothesis, we're probably not going to be able to prove much of anything. All right, so n squared minus 4 is even. Could there be a contradiction somewhere here? Let me pick an odd number. Suppose I pick n to be 3. That's odd. Um, n squared minus 4 is going to be 9 minus 4 is 5. That's going to be odd, too. So for n equals 3, I can contradict this. What about n equals 5? 25 minus 4 is 21. That's going to contradict this, too. What about 1? 1 squared minus 4 is minus 3. Minus 3 is an odd number. So now it's starting to look like this statement 1 might directly contradict this hypothesis in statement 2. So that's my new goal. I'm going to see if I can prove that since n is odd, n squared minus 4 is also odd. All right, well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to use the substitution of odd. So n equals 2 times some integer plus 1. That's the definition of being an odd number. And same thing we usually do in these. Once we have a definition, we just substitute and do some algebra, simplify, try to get things in a form that does something useful for us. So let's substitute this into there. And again, it's got to be a proposition. I can't just write 2k plus 1 squared. Okay, But I can say n squared minus 4 equals 2k plus 1 squared minus 4. That's substitution of 3 into 2. All right? And this is all still logically valid, right? This is a true proposition. This is a true proposition. So if I let n be this in here, I should end up with something that's still a true proposition. In this case, n squared minus 4 equals 2k plus 1 squared minus 4. Now we pull out our algebra. And I'm going to do some simplification. So I've shown n squared minus 4 is 4k squared plus 4k minus 3. And our goal is we want to show n squared minus 4 equals 2 times some integer plus 1. So now our goal is to write 4k squared plus 4k minus 3 as 2 times something plus 1. And if I try to factor out a 2, well, this is clearly a multiple of 2 because it's 4 times something. This is clearly a multiple of 2 because it's, you know, 4, which is 2 times 2 times k. And this is not exactly a 1 but it's an odd number. So, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this as 2 times 2k squared. 
so that's clearly a multiple of 2, plus 2 times 2k, so this is clearly a multiple of 2. And instead of minus 3, I'm going to write minus 4 plus 1. And this is a trick. There's always a trick in these proofs. There's usually one point where something a little slick happens. Okay. And in this case, it's writing minus 3 as minus 4 plus 1. Why do I want to do that? Because... Minus 4 is 2 times 2. And now I've written this as a bunch of things, each of which is a multiple of 2 plus 1. And so if I factor out that 2, I can put things in this form. All right, this is not my proof. Right? This is a proposition. This is not. This is just doodling. This is, this is thinking out loud. But now I know the path to get from here to my conclusion that this thing is odd, which will be my contradiction. So I'm going to do more algebra. And you could show your work, right? Or you could leave it um, to your algebra-aware reader. Right, And assuming that the reader understands algebra, they can say, okay, this is 4k squared plus 4k minus 4 plus 1 minus 3. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a valid statement. Um, but that's the punchline, right? n squared minus 4 is equal to this. And now you can say n squared minus 4 is odd. And that's the definition of odd. And now we have a contradiction between statement 2 and statement 6. Therefore, n is even. And that's what we were trying to show. All right, cool. So yeah, most of these are, are they come down to working with the definitions plugging things in, and usually somewhere there's like one little thing you have to to see, right? Like I can write minus 3 like this. Um, and earlier on, deciding if you're going to go direct or indirect. But yeah, the substitution is definitely very important. All right, good. Um, other questions on the homework? Cool. All right, so let's continue talking about modular arithmetic. This is where we left off on Wednesday, and we were looking at uh, multiplication tables for, um, for different moduli. And if we wrote a multiplication table and we ignored the zeros because multiplying by zero is usually pretty easy, we found the following. Right, so multiplication modulo 5 looked like this. So 4 times 4 is 16, which is one more than a multiple of 5. Right? And we, we ended with this observation that in this table, um, every row contains a 1, and no rows contain a 0. And similarly, every column contains a 1, and no columns contain a 0. And if we did this modulo something that was not prime, this would not happen. We would find rows that contained zeros, and we would find rows that did not contain ones. 
And so there was something fundamental about our moduli based on whether or not it was prime. In particular, multiplication by 3 has this funny row to it. All right, so if we want to do division modulo something, it's a little tricky. So suppose we want to do 2 divided by 3 modulo 5. <clears throat> well, 2 thirds isn't even an integer, right? Um, so, so what is this business of 2 thirds modulo 5? Well, um, if x equals 2 thirds modulo 5, then 3x should be 2 modulo 5. And if we look at the multiplication table for 3, if we multiply 3 by 4, we get 2. So we have this funny fact that 4 is equal to 2 thirds. Well, that's a little weird. But there's, there's a sense in which this, this is a reasonable thing to do. Now, we don't usually do this, but here's what we can do. We can talk about the inverse of 3. So 3 to the minus 1 equals the number x such that 3 times x is equal to 1. Because 3 to the minus 1, that's just saying 1 divided by 3. So if you want to find the inverse of 3, it's the number which, when multiplied by 3, gives us 1. Well, what do we multiply 3 by to get 1? We get 2. So 3 inverse is equal to 2. 2 inverse is going to be equal to 3. The inverse of 1 is just 1. And the inverse of 4 is 4. So there's the table of inverses mod 5. And so if we want 2 divided by 3, well, it's just 2 times 1 third. 2 times 2 is 4. That's what 2 thirds is equal to. And this makes sense as long as these inverses exist and they're unique. And that's, that's guaranteed to happen if we work over a prime. But if we work over a moduli like 6, right, There is no inverse for 3. There's nothing we can multiply 3 by that makes it equal to 1, modulo 6. Because when we multiply 3 by anything, we get either 3 or 0. So here we don't always have inverses. Here we do. This is one reason prime numbers are cool. All right. And then the other thing that we were commenting on on Wednesday was this idea that Modular arithmetic lets us take the whole infinite space of integers, right, which have a lot of numbers um, in that space, and all the arithmetic we might do on those, if we're going to reduce modulo something at the end, we can reduce along the way. And we did some calculations like this. So, so if we wanted to do, um, you know, 16 to the 512th mod 3... Well, 16 is congruent to 1. It's 1 more than 15, so this is going to be congruent to 1 to the 5 12th, which is just going to be 1. So we can multiply things together and then reduce, or we can reduce things and then multiply. And we should end up at the same place. So that's kind of a happy fact. And these modular operations are well behaved. So they have all the properties that we're used to. So um, A times B is going to be congruent to B times A. A plus B is going to be congruent to B plus A. A times B plus C will be congruent to B plus C times A, which will be congruent to AB plus AC, and so on and so forth. So we have commutivity, we have associativity, we have distribution, and so on.
and that's useful. We always have additive inverses. So for any A, there exists something we call negative A, which when you add to A gives you zero. So negatives exist. For example, mod 5, 1 plus 4 equals 0, 2 plus 3 equals 0. So 4 is the same thing as negative 1. And 3 is the same thing as negative 2. So we have additive inverses. And if we're working a prime modulo, we have multiplicative inverses. That's the 1 over x for anything other than 0. So a lot of what we do in modular arithmetic is almost exactly the same as what we do with plain old integers. And then there's a few things that can surprise us. But mostly we can manipulate things modulo n just like we were manipulating plain old integers. All right. So let's look at some, some ways that we can use this. Um, let me talk about something called modular exponentiation. And this is a, a special technique. For raising some number to another power um, where your numbers might be really big. Okay, so for example, um, calculate um, 3 to the 17th modulo 7. All right, so 3 to the 17th mod 7. And, and for reference... Three to the seventeenth. It's not a huge number, but it's it's pretty big. Um, let's find the remainder when we divide by seven. So, um, you know, three mod seven. Well, three is already three, so so we could raise it to the seventeenth power. It's going to be a big number. Um, here's one thing we can do. This is not modular exponentiation, but this is what we can do in a pinch. We can say three squared is nine. And that's congruent to 2 mod 7. 3 cubed would thus be congruent to 2 times 3, which is 6. 3 to the 4th would be 3 cubed times 3. Well, 3 cubed is congruent to 6 times 3 would be 18. And that's 4 more than 14, so that's congruent to 4. So if we have enough time, we can keep doing this. Right? And after 17 steps, we'll know what 3 to the 17th is. And we're never doing very advanced math. right? Because 3 to the n, the biggest it's going to be is 6. And to find the next power of 3, I have to multiply that by 3, which is 18. Well, that's not a bad number. I can find 18 mod 7. right? And, and if I want to find 3 to the 6th, well, I know that's 3 to the 5th times 3, and I already found 3 to the 5th is 5. So 3 to the 5th times 3 will be the same thing as 5 times 3, which is 15, which will be congruent to 1. So I can do this and eventually get down to 3 to the 17th and see what that's congruent to. But there's a trick we can use, and this comes down to understanding binary. So the trick is we're going to leapfrog. We're not going to calculate every power of 3. We're only going to ca calculate five different powers of 3. So here's what we're going to do. So this is, this is uh, 
This is the way we do it if we don't know modular exponentiation. If we know modular exponenti exponentiation, here's what we do. So let me start off. 3 to the first is just 3. And this is all mod 7. Okay, 3 squared is going to be 3 squared, which is 9, which is congruent to 2 mod 7. All right, I'm not going to calculate 3 cubed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to square this. And I'm going to say 3 to the 4th is just 3 squared squared. And I know 3 squared was 2, so 3 to the 4th should be 2 squared, which is 4. Okay, I leaped ahead. I found 3 to the 4th without finding 3 cubed. I'm going to do this again. 3 to the 8th is 3 to the 4th squared. And you have to go back to your laws of exponents to see this, but 3 to the 4th squared is 3 to the 4th twice. So it's 3, 4 times done twice, that's 3 to the 8th. And 3 to the 4th I already found was 4, so 3 to the 8th should be 4 squared, which is 16, which is just 2 more than 14. And then I'll do this one more time, 3 to the 16th will be 3 to the 8th squared, 3 to the 8th was 2, so this will be 2 squared, which is 4. Alright, so I've written 5 powers of 3 modulo 7. And now if my goal is to find 3 to the 17th, well, I take the number 17 and I write it in binary. And what does that binary expansion mean? It means... 17 equals um, 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 4th. Okay, which we also write as 1 plus 16. Well, if 17 is equal to 1 plus 16, 3 to the 17th is 3 to the 1st times 3 to the 16th. It's another law of exponents. And so 3 to the 1st is congruent to 3, and 3 to the 16th is congruent to 4, so 3 to the 17th must be congruent to 3 times 4, which is 12, which is congruent to 5. So double check, 3 to the 17th minus 5 is this number right here. If I take that and I divide it by 7, divides it perfectly. All right, but once I have this table, I can do all kinds of calculations. Suppose I want to know 3 to the uh, 26th mod 7. Well, 26, you write it as a sum of powers of 2. So it's equal to 16 plus 8 plus 2. Right. How do you know that? Well, write 26 in binary. 26 is equal to 11010 zero, zero, base 2. So that's 2, that's 8, that's 16. All right, so 3 to the 26th would be 3 to the 16th times 3 to the 8th times 3 squared. And that's congruent to, well, 3 to the 16th is congruent to 4. 3 to the 8th is congruent to 2. 3 squared is congruent to 2. 4 times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, and 16 is congruent to 2. So 3 to the 26th minus 2 is this number, and that should be a perfect multiple of 7. All right, let's see. Question, I'm confused about how you got 3 to the 16th. Um, so 3 to the 16th is the square of 3 to the 8th, right? So 3 to the 16th is 3 to the 8th squared. I had previously found 3 to the 8th was 2. So 3 to the 8th squared will be congruent to 2 squared.
So this two was right there. This was this four. This was this two. This was this three. And if I needed three to the 32nd, what would that be? That would be four squared, which is 16, which would be two. So if I find eight powers of three, and what each of those is congruent to mod seven, I can easily find three to any number up to 255 by just multiplying the right powers of three. So uh, someone said, couldn't we do 3 to the 13th times 3 to the 13th for this? Yeah, we could, but then we'd have to calculate 3 to the 13th. And how would you do that? Right? So you could do it by starting at 3 to the 1st and working 12 times, or you could use some trick. So if we do this, we're kind of doing the least amount of work in general um, to be able to write 3 to any power as a product of, of 3 raised to other powers. But if you did 3 to the 13th and you, you squared that, you should exactly get the same thing, absolutely. Um, but 3 to the 13th, well, I could do that as 3 to the 1st times 4th times 8th. That would be 3 times 4 times 2, which would be 24, which would be a 3. And then if I squared that, I would get 9, and that's 2 more than a multiple of 7. So you can play around with this, right, and, and have lots of fun finding patterns. Um, and that works. So this is called modular exponentiation. And it works really well when you have some number and you want to raise it to a potentially really large power, right? And if we're just doing 3 to the 8th, we can just multiply by itself 7 times. That's not bad, but if we're doing 3 to the millionth, right, we don't want to multiply 3 by itself a million times, that's a lot of work. But if we write this out as a product of 3 raised to powers of 2, at most we have 20 numbers we have to calculate, because a million is 20 bits in binary. So we would calculate this table up to, you know, 3 to the, two to the 20th, and then just multiply the appropriate terms together. All right, so two other comments on this. Um, one, when we get down to something like this where we have to multiply uh, four by two by two, right? Well, I did it in my head. I did four times two times two is 16. Um, but if we had, you know, 10 of these things to multiply, potentially our numbers get really big, but we can keep reducing, right? I can say four times two times two is congruent to, well, I can multiply these first two and say this is eight times two. And that 8, I can reduce that to 1, because 8 is congruent to 1 mod 7. So this is 1 times 2, which is congruent to 2. I didn't have to deal with this big, huge number 16. I just had to deal with an 8. So if I have 20 numbers I need to multiply together and reduce, I can multiply the first 2, reduce, multiply by the third, reduce, multiply by the fourth, reduce. And in this case, I never have to work with a number bigger than, you know, 40-something. So that's handy. The other thing worth noting here is that if I continued building this table, here's what I would see. I would see 3 squared was congruent to 2, 3 to the 4th was congruent to 4, 3 to the 8th we said was congruent to 2, 3 to the 16th was congruent to 4, If I want to keep filling out this table, I've got a pattern already. I know that 4 squared is congruent to 2, 2 squared is congruent to 4. So I can keep doing this, and I don't actually have to do a whole lot of thinking. Right? 3 to the 1024, I already know it's congruent to 4. Right? Why? Because 3 to the 512 will be 2, and 3 to the 1024 will be 4. So we can work with these really big numbers, right? And, and 3 to the... 1024th, right? It's a pretty big number. It takes five or six lines. Um, and, and it doesn't take much work to calculate. 
Okay, so that's modular exponentiation. All right, questions about that? So Monday's homework set will have uh, number theory questions on it where we'll do modular exponentiation and greatest common factors and all sorts of, of good stuff like that. All right, so let's, um, let's go back to talking about primes. So we've, we've talked a little about prime numbers already, so numbers that are only divisible by themselves or 1. Um, and so 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, um, these are all prime numbers. Primes have been studied for centuries, right? The Greeks knew about primes. Um, they were interested in them. Um, one of our first techniques for um, testing primality comes from the Greeks, it's something called the sieve of Aristosthenes, um, which I will spell for you because I finally learned how to spell it. So the sieve of, but I'm going to peek at my spelling. Um, it's easier to write than today. Sieve of Aristosthenes. Um, and this was a way to, to tell if numbers are prime or not. And it's a really simple technique. Um, start off by writing down all of your numbers. Well, maybe not all of them, because we only have a certain amount of time. But I'll go up to 30. All right, so here's what we do. We circle the first number. That's the number two. Now we cross out every other number, every second number, because that's a two. So cross these out. All right, circle the first number. That's a three, cross out every third number. So six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. Circle the first number that's not crossed out, that's a 5. Cross out every fifth number, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Circle the first number that's not crossed out, cross out every seventh number, 14, 21, 28. Circle the first number that's not crossed out, cross out every eleventh number, so 22. Circle the first number, 13, cross out every thirteenth number, Circle the first number that's not crossed out. Cross out every 17th number. There is none. Circle the first number. Cross out every 19th. There is none. And then there's your 23 and there's your 29. And those are your primes between 2 and 30. All right. So that's, that's a really cool way to, to, to find primes, right? Um, but, but it only works if, you know, you write out all the numbers up to a million. You can find all the primes up to a million this way. But it's a lot of writing. Um, but that works. And that was known to the Greeks. Um, all right. Here's something called... Fundamental theorem of arithmetic. You didn't know arithmetic had any theorems, right? Let alone a fundamental one. All right, what's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? Um, something that, that we probably already know or would easily believe, um, but let me paraphrase it for you, okay? So basically, 
any positive integer bigger than 1 can be written as a product of primes. If the number itself is prime, we just write it as itself, right? So 7 is just 7. It's a silly product. But, you know, uh, 63 can be written as 3 times 21. Well, 21 is not prime, but 21 can be written as 3 times 7. So there's a product of primes that gives us 63. All right. The fundamental theorem says any positive integer bigger than 1 can be written as a product of primes. And we can do that uniquely with a little legal disclaimer on the word uniquely. Okay, so what do I mean by uniquely? Clearly, if I write 63 as 3 th times 3 times 7, it's also 7 times 3 times 3. Does that violate the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? No. That's a silly variation on 3 times 3 times 7. Okay, what the theorem really says is that you can write it uniquely as a product of primes up to rearranging those primes. Okay, stating that formally takes a little bit of work and I think it loses the spirit of the theorem. So basically there's a unique way to factor numbers into primes. Okay, where we don't consider, you know, 3 times 7 to be a different factoring from 7 times 3. All right, and this is true for, for all integers bigger than or equal to 2. It turns out it's not always true for other types of numbers. There are other systems of numbers in which we can define multiplication. We did this with modular systems, for example. And in some of these other systems, unique factorization does not apply. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic does not apply. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. All right, well, um, how do we tell if a number is prime? So someone hands you a number and wants to know if it's prime or not. How can you tell? You've done this in 121. You've done this in 120, actually. I think we still have this as a 120 exercise when we talk about programming. Um, How do we know if that's a prime number or not? Is there any way to tell? Divided by a bunch of numbers, exactly. Start dividing it and see if anything goes into it. How many numbers do we have to check? Well, no more than a thousand and one, probably fewer than that, right? So can we divide it by two? No. Can we divide it by three? No. Can we divide it by four? Can we divide it by five? Right? I'm not going to see if it can be divided by one, because that doesn't stop it from being prime. I'm not going to see if it can be divided by a thousand and one, because that doesn't stop it. But if I know it's not divisible by any of these 999 numbers, then I know it's prime. So yeah, we can do a lot better on this, and, and people are already um, suggesting this in chat. Um, so one thing we can do is we don't need to divide by every number. Because if 1001 over A is equal to B, then... 1,001 divided by B is also equal to A. So we only have to check cases where we're dividing by something which is smaller than what the quotient would be. Okay, if you do the calculations, we only have to go up to something less than or equal to the square root of the number that we're testing. And that's a huge time saver. 
All right. The next thing is we don't need to test divisibility by all of these numbers, partially because of the fundamental theorem. If our number is divisible by 6 times 3, uh, by 6, so if 1001 is equal to 6 times something, well, we know that 6 can be written as 3 times 2 times something. Our number would be divisible by 3. It would also be divisible by 2. So really, all we have to do is check for divisibility by prime numbers. So we only have to check primes up to the square root of 1,001. Well, a square root of 1,001, it's around 30-something, right? So there aren't that many primes. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31. 11 primes. And we should be good. And that's a whole lot less work than doing 999 primes, uh, factors. And if you're generating primes, right, as you generate more and more primes, you can save the list of, of prime numbers you found and use those to do your division. If we don't want to do all that work, here's something we can do. We can simply not worry about the even divisors, other than two. So see if your number's even. If it's not, just try dividing by odd numbers up to the square root of the number. And that's fairly efficient. All right, so yeah, someone did, pro um, did the Euler project where they ask you to find the millionth prime. And if you don't do this, it's going to be a really slow program. Um, and we'll, we'll play around with some code. I think your first programming assignment is going to involve uh, coding some stuff to do with prime numbers. Um, I need to get that posted one of these days soon. All right, so this, this is trial division. And it's a pretty good first-order approach to testing primality. Wow, I never... All right, um, let's see, what else should I tell you? Um, how many prime numbers are there? We've named a few. What do you think, how many primes? Infinite, that sounds like a good guess. It turns out there are an infinite number of primes. And this can be proven, and the proof was known to the Greeks also. Um, so, so let's prove this. Um, prove there are an infinite number of primes. And it's actually a pretty straightforward proof. Um, this is a good example of a proof by contradiction. Okay, so step one. Um, suppose there are only finite finitely many primes. So let me call this set of primes P1, P2, P3, up to Pj. Uh, Suppose that's the entire set of primes. All right, well, um, I'm going to make some number n and I'm going to set n equal to the product of those primes plus 1.
All right, well, this number that I've gotten is clearly bigger than any of our primes p sub i, right? It's bigger than p1 because it's, it's, you know, p1 times some other stuff plus 1. It's bigger than pj because it's pj times some other stuff plus 1. So n is a number that's bigger than any of those primes. And it turns out um, p1 does not divide n. Well, how do I know that? Because n is p1 times an integer plus 1. It's one more than a multiple of p1. And n is also one more than a multiple of p2. So p2 does not divide n. And n is one more than a multiple of pj. So pj does not divide n. So n is not divisible by any prime number anywhere in the world. Well, if it's not divisible by any prime, then n must be prime itself. But that's a contradiction. Because since n is bigger than any of these, n is not an element of this set. And so there is a prime number that's not in this set, which we said contained all the prime numbers. Therefore, this supposition must be false, and so there is an infinite number of primes. All right, so pretty straightforward to, to show there's an infinite number of primes. And like I say, the Greeks knew this. Um, and that's kind of cool. And if you look at prime numbers, um, as you get bigger, the prime numbers tend to get farther apart. Right, look at your first few primes, 2, 3, 5, 7. Well, those are right next to each other. Those differ by 2, those differ by 2. We have to jump up to 11, that's a gap of 4, but then 13 is right next to 11, and then we have another gap of 4, and then another one right next, and another gap of 4. So yeah, it feels like, you know, these are pretty close to each other. Um, but then the next one is 29, so now we've got a gap of 6, right? And as you go out to larger and larger numbers, you find bigger and bigger gaps between primes. And that makes sense, because the larger a number is, the more things you have that might divide it, right? And by the time you get to a million, you've got this whole bunch of prime numbers, smaller than the square root of a million, that could be factors of a million. It's getting harder and harder to be a prime number the larger you are. But one of the interesting things is, no matter how far out you look, we keep finding these so-called twin primes consecutive odd numbers that are both prime. And these get further apart, right? I mean, we had a twin primes here, twin primes there, twin primes there, twin primes there. When you get out to a million, a billion, a zillion, um, the occurrence of these twin primes starts to get further and further out. Um, but they keep occurring as far as we know. Now, nobody has proven that, but nobody has disproven it either. And we've we found some pretty convincing bounds on what would have to happen if twin primes stopped existing beyond some point. Um, but we don't know. It's an open question. And it's a really simple question to state. If somebody knows how to divide, you can tell them what a prime is, and you can say, you know, is there a limit to where you find two consecutive odd numbers that are prime? It's a simple question, but nobody has an answer. And this is, this is classic in number theory, and especially things related to primes. Um, simple sounding questions may have very complex answers. And I'll give you the sort of classic example of this. This is something called Fermat's Last Theorem. Yeah, last. Um, and here's why it's called Fermat's last theorem. So Fermat was a mathematician. Um, 
he was reading a book in his study um, on what are called Diophantine equations. These are integer equations, right? So algebra, right, it's, it's pretty easy to, to say, you know, find me an equation where a squared plus b squared is equal to 25. Well, you know, I could do 1 and the square root of 24. I could do the square root of 12 and the square root of 13. But can you solve this in integers, right? And it turns out you can. You can do uh, 3 squared plus 4 squared, or you could do negative 3 squared plus negative 4 squared, or 3 squared negative 4. So, so he was reading a book on these kinds of equations. They're called Diophantine equations. And this book was talking about, you know, when solutions to equations like this exist in integers, in whole numbers. And there was a section that was talking about um, just this kind of case where you have x squared plus y squared equals z squared. So-called Pythagorean triples because they look like Pythagorean triangles, two lengths and a hypotenuse. Um, so this book was talking about, you know, when solutions to this exist. And Fermat wrote a little note in the margin of his book where he made the following observation that um, there were no integers which satisfied this equation, x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed, in an interesting way. Now I can do 0 cubed plus 0 cubed equals 0 cubed. That's not very interesting. Or 4 cubed plus 0 cubed equals 4 cubed. That's not very interesting. But he made this note in the margin saying that um, there's no integers that satisfy this equation. And in fact, um, there are no integers which satisfy this equation for any integer n bigger than 2. So you can't do it for cubes or fourths or fifths or hundredths. And he made, made the statement below this that um, he's thought of a marvelous proof for this, which is too large to write in this margin. And, and sometime after that, he passed away. And sometime after that, somebody found his copy of this book and was flipping through it and saw his note in the margin saying, you cannot solve this equation for n bigger than 2. And there's a clever little proof for it that's bigger than the margin of the book, but, you know, small enough to think up in your head. And so this became called Fermat's Last Theorem, right? And people started searching for a proof for this. Fermat had an answer. He came up with it in his head. Let's figure out what it was. And it's such a simple equation, right? Can you find two cubes that add up to another cube? But as much as people tried, nobody was able to find a proof for this, and nobody was able to find an example where x to the n plus y to the n was z to the n. And this went on for a long time, okay, hundreds of years. Um, and the consensus was Fermat probably did not have a proof. But a lot of people came up with proofs um, that they were pretty sure were good, and then they would publish it, and people would look at it, and they would find some problem in it. And yeah, people wondered, you know, was this just pranking? Um, so one of the, the promising proofs quite some time ago um, worked with a different set of numbers. Instead of integers, it was integers with, I think, the square root of minus 5 added to them. And this person came up with a beautiful proof of Fermat's last theorem. But what he inadvertently did was he assumed the fundamental theorem of arithmetic applied in his number system. And with that assumption, he had a proof for Fermat's last theorem. But somebody eventually came up and said, hey, guess what? Fundamental theorem doesn't work in your number system. And this person showed him a counterexample. And that was it. The whole proof fell apart. So the person who had done this proof spent a good part of his life after that trying to modify the number system to restore the fundamental theorem. And they invented a branch of mathematics called ideal theory. And ideal numbers were the numbers you needed to get unique factorization. So this is a simple problem, right? I mean, that's the whole statement of it that has just led to huge breakthroughs in mathematics, creation of entirely new fields, um, and a lot of excitement. 
and a lot of interest and work from people who are not professional mathematicians, but people who hear this and are intrigued by it and, and decide to explore it and play around with it. And it's referenced in Star Trek episodes and all kinds of things. So this was finally proved in the early 90s. And the proof is, is phenomenally complex and beautiful. Um, and it comes out of an area called algebraic geometry. And I happened to be studying algebraic geometry at Duke at the time that this was breaking. And they had a really active algebraic geometry department. And um, everybody knew everybody. And so it was super exciting, right? Um, and at the end of the proof where this person was presenting it for the first time publicly, he, he, you know, had filled up board after board with all of this stuff that's meaningless to most people. Um, and he got to one point and then he just said, I think I'll stop there. And if you were one of the few people who understood mathematics at that level, you could see the path from what he had last written on the board to the proof of this theorem. Um, but it was just, it was one of the crowning achievements um, and just brought in so many different areas of mathematics. So you can look this up. Just, just Google Fermat's Last Theorem, and you can find you know, lots of books written about it and lots of uh, fiction and things like that. Um, but classic number theory kind of setup, right? Really simple statement, incredibly complex to actually, um, to actually prove or disprove. Okay? Same thing with twin primes. We don't know. Let me show you another one. This is called gold box conjecture. And this one is even simpler to state than Fermat's last theorem. So let's pick an even number. An even integer bigger than 2. So 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 and so on. Here's what Goldbach's conjecture says. It says every even number bigger than 2 can be written as a sum of two primes. Well, 4 is 2 plus 2. That's done. 6 is 3 plus 3. 8 is 3 plus 5. 10 is 5 plus 5 or 3 plus 7. This is 5 plus 7. This is 7 plus 7. This is 3 plus 13. This is um, 5 plus 13. Right? Can you prove it? Nobody's ever proved it. It sounds, you know, plausible. Um, but, you know, these prime numbers get further and further apart. We have fewer and fewer of them as we get larger. Is it possible that there's some peculiar even number somewhere out there that cannot be written as a sum of two primes? Nobody knows. It's an open question. All right, so there's lots of stuff like this in number theory. And they're fun problems to think about and work on if you like puzzles and you like numbers. Um, and what's really remarkable is for these things that haven't been solved, if you look at what people have done in trying to solve them. For example, this is known up to some ridiculously huge even number. And people have put bounds on the conditions that n has to satisfy if Goldbach's conjecture breaks for that n. And the bounds are so specific that it's really, really hard to imagine um, such a number existing. But nobody's proven that it doesn't. All right, let me give you a result that is known. Um, this has been known for a long time. Um, the number of primes. So we know there's an infinite number of primes. If we just don't limit how big a number we're looking at, there's no limit to the number of primes. But an interesting question is um, how many primes are there? less than or equal to a given number n. So let's, let's make a function. 
let p of n equal the number of primes less than or equal to n. All right, so p of 2 would be 1, p of 3 would be 2, p of 4 would be 2, p of 5 would be 3, p of 6 would also be 3, p of 7 would be 4. So this is a function that goes up in steps, right? It slowly increases as n gets bigger and bigger, and it jumps up every time you hit a new prime number. And if there's twin primes, you have a case where it makes two steps in a row like that, right? Because this number was prime, and so it bumped up, and the next number was prime, and so it bumped up again. So you can capture some of these, these questions about primes in this graph of this function, right? Number of primes less than or equal to n. And we do not have a formula for p of n, right? And there's no formula for generating primes. There's no equation you can plug in n and it'll give you the nth prime, at least not that we know of. Um, so this is a, a peculiar function. If you really want to lose yourself down a rabbit hole, um, Go ahead and Google a zeta function. And this is related to the number of primes less than n. Okay, so we don't have a formula for p of n. But we do have an approximation for p of n as n gets bigger. So I think this is the only time I'll use the word limit and infinity in this course. Um, but here's a fact. The limit as n approaches infinity of p of n over the natural log of n is equal to 1. So the number of primes less than or equal to n is approximately the natural log of n, where natural log is logarithm base e, 2.718, etc. And this should raise your eyebrows, right? Because log base e, well, what is e? e is this, you know, this weird constant that pops up in, in nature all over the place. And it's 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial, right? The sum of reciprocals of factorials and all kinds of other stuff. And it's this, this thing that if you take the derivative of e to the x, you just get e to the x. And if you take the integral of e to the x, you just get e to the x. And somehow this comes into play with prime numbers, with this question of how many primes there are up to n. And this is where you start to get a glimpse that there's like interconnection between all these things that may not seem connected to each other. Um, but the number e and the fact that its rate of change is the same as its function value is tied into the number of primes up to n. And that's kind of cool. This is unrelated, but while we're here, Have you seen this? If you take e and you raise it to the pi times i, do you know what you get? Someone in here will know. Take this number e, raise it to the pi times the square root of minus 1. Yeah, you get minus 1. And that's arguably the coolest equation in all of mathematics. So you've got, you know, rates of growth, you've got circles, you've got imaginary numbers, and they're all related to each other in this beautiful relationship that says e to the pi i is minus 1. I had a student who had that tattooed on his arm. It was, like, really cool. <laughs> all right, so, yeah, lots of, lots of symmetries and beauty and, um, and things like that. And yeah, you can prove that, and you can prove the prime number theorem. 
um, that the number of primes is, is log of n um, in the limit. Those are all proven, and they come out of largely um, an area of mathematics called complex analysis, um, which is like calculus done, but instead of just doing real numbers, you do calculus on complex numbers. So you include, you know, x plus i times y, um, and you do your calc on there. Oh, you did it in Calc 3. Cool. Awesome. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. I want to leave that for next time. Um, oh, let me just tell you about cicadas. Um, so how many people here have experience with cicadas? I think I asked that last time, and some people did. Um... So here's a cicada. Um, right. So there are these bugs that um, they're about the size of, of large crickets. Um, they eat plants. They don't bite people. Um, they have these big bug eyes. They have um, amazing colors. Their their wings are these iridescent rainbow colors. Um, and they pop up out of the ground every 17 years. And they pop out, they, they, um, they find a mate, hopefully. Um, they climb up in trees, they, um, they live for a few days, they die, right? But before they die, the larvae of the next um, batch of cicadas drop into the ground and burrow down. And they hang out there for 17 years. And after 17 years, um, they all emerge. And they do this over a period of weeks, once every 17 years. Um, if you ever have a chance to experience one of these, it's, it's amazing. Um, if you go out in the middle of the woods during um, this period when these cicadas are coming out, it's deafening, the sound they make. It's just this chirping sound. Um, and it's fairly disgusting in you know, an area where people are because the road will just be covered with cicadas. And you drive, and your windshield just gets covered with cicadas. It's it's nasty, um, but the numbers of these things are just phenomenal. And they do this on a 17-year cycle. And there's you know occasionally a few stragglers who come out the year after or the year before, but by and large, the whole population comes out once every 17 years. Um, there's another brood that comes out once every 13 years. Not as not as uh, common. Um, and there's speculation, you know, about the fact that 13 and 17 are prime numbers. Um, is that deliberate or not? I don't know. But here's one thing that, that, um, that is true. 13 and 17, they're both prime numbers. The chance of these broods coming out at the same time, right, is relatively small. But if the 13-year cycle and the 17 cycle both appeared the same year, it would be almost 300 years before that happened again because 13 and 17 are prime numbers, right? So, so the number of times it would take for them to come out before they would be in sync again is 13 times 17. That's something that happens with primes. Now, if they came out at four years and eight years, right, then every other um, four-year period, they would both be emerging. So, yeah, secret society of cicadas. <laughs> All right, so um, so we're out of time here. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, some aspects of prime numbers next time. Um, a few more factoids about about sequences of primes, um, open problems. Then I want to talk about um, finding greatest common factors of numbers, which is something we'll use for um, for RSA. And then I want to talk about applications. So we'll look at some applications of this for, um, for coding systems, for uh, error checking in computers, and we'll wrap it up with um, looking at public key crypto systems. So that'll be Monday, and then Wednesday we'll probably go back to looking at proofs. All right, have a great weekend. I will see you next week. Thank you. Oh.